Greetings, folks. My name is Dustin Cormier. This is How to Rock Astrology. I'm a tropical Vedic astrologer, and this is a continuation of our uh, episode discussing Purva Ashada, Nakshatra. Today, in particular, we're getting into a discussion of the nature of Apam. That's the water goddess, uh, as she is portrayed in the classical Vedas. So this comes from the divine forces of the Chatras, portrayed by an author named Radha. She's a great consolidator of information. Uh, she is a sidereal zodiac practitioner, but her work is always very solidly uh, researched, backed by sources, and she seems to have a great breadth and grasp on the classical Vedic idea of the deities of the nakshatras, which teaches a lot, us a lot about the nakshatras themselves. So today in particular, of course, we are digging into chapter 24 of this book in order to dig into Abbas, it's Purva Ashada, the purifying water goddesses, plural that is. So the first thing we read is from the Rig Veda. It reads, Since, waters, you are the source of happiness, grant us energy-giving food and an insight to enjoy your divine splendor. Like affectionate mothers, may you bless us that we enjoy in this life your sweetest love. It's Rig Veda, chapter 10. Section 10, Mandala 9. I believe that might be Mandala 10. So this is our first section of this chapter. We're getting into the cosmic waters of creation. So, as with the other divine forces, the Abbas goddesses, are beckoned to take their seats upon the sacrificial barhis, grasses. Now to this grass come the longing waters. The pious ones are seated at our worship. It's Rig Veda Mandala 10. They are reverend in the Vedic scriptures for their terrestrial, atmospheric, and celestial forms. And this quote comes from the Taittiriya Brahmana. An invitation. Let the heavenly waters who have united with milk, i.e. with invigorating sap, those who are in the atmosphere and those who are coming from the earth, let those waters whose wish the Ashadas, the first Ashadas, their nakshatra, obey be pleasant and agreeable to us. Now this oblation, the waters of the wells and of the rivers and of the sea and of the ponds and those waters which are congealed. Let those waters whose sweetness the Ashadas enjoy be pleasant and agreeable to us. That's from the Taittiriya Brahmana discussing Apas, the waters who belong in the nature of the Ashadas and who, interestingly, come from earth through the atmosphere up to the heaven. It's as if the waters are the conveyors of Om Bhum Bhurvas, Bhuvasvaha. <clears throat> now, in one of the Rig Vedic cosmology hymns, Arishi envisions the birth of the creator from the womb of the cosmic waters. Impregnated by the universal germ of Agni, the waters form a golden embryo, it's Hiranyagarbha, from which Prajapati, the creator of all creatures, is birthed. Quote, the waters coming to everything, existing, and covering everything, received Agni as their germ, 
so as to produce ka prajalpati. It's Brahma. This is almost like in Genesis when God floated above the waters. A similar hymn is found in the Shatapatha Brahmana. We read, Verily, in the beginning, this universe was water, nothing but a sea of water. The waters desired, how can we be reproduced? They toiled and performed fervid devotions, tapas. When they were becoming heated, that's impregnated by Agni's seed, a golden egg, the Hiranyagarbha, was produced. In a year's time, a man, this Prajalpati, Brahma, was produced therefrom. It's interesting to think that, you know, it's likely, so far as we know, that the earth was probably covered in water at a point before the land emerged. <laughs> Billions of years ago. Now, as mothers of the Creator, the Appas goddesses are extolled as caretakers and nurturers of the earth, of gods and mankind. Their Vedic epithets are derived from various connotations of the term mother, such as matris, the mothers, ambas, which is good mothers, janitris, which is generous mothers, and yuvatis, which is young mothers. The apas goddesses are implored for fertility and procreative strength, and elsewhere, eulogized for their invigorating and inspiring nature. The natural flow of all rivers and streams is towards the sea. Thus, the Apas goddesses desire most of all to merge with the mighty ocean. Now we have a footnote here that says Apa, the waters, the word, is derived from the root word ap. And here we read that that means to obtain. So now we have a quote, and this comes from the Taittiriya Brahmana again. The waters desired. May we conquer the object of our desire, the ocean. They offered that well-known sacrificial pap to the waters, i.e. to themselves, and to the ashadhas, who are their nakshatra. Consequently, they conquered the object of their desire, the ocean. He indeed conquers the object of his desire, even if it is as great as the ocean. He who offers that oblation and who thus knows it. So, on this occasion, after the chief oblation, he, the sacrificer, offers the additional oblations, saying, to the waters, svaha, to the ocean, svaha, to desire, svaha, to conquest, svaha. Of course, svaha almost always means, I'm giving to you, I respect you, and it's namo, it's obeisance. And that, cut, that quote comes from the Taittiriya Brahmana, chapter 3. Now, in ancient times, the Appas goddesses were exalted for their curative powers. For example, in the Rig Veda, O waters teeming with medicine, keep my body safe from harm so that we may see the sun for a long time. Beautiful. That's Rig Veda, Mandala 10. Now, the same is true in the Atharva Veda. Quote, the waters verily are healing. The waters chase away disease. The waters cure all disease. May they prepare a remedy for thee. That's from Atharva Veda, chapter 6. For their curative powers, the waters of India's antiquity are declared the most skilled of all physicians. And again, this is a Atharva Veda quote from the Himavat Mountains. 
the waters flow forth, and the ocean, forsooth, is their assembling place. May the waters, indeed, grant me that cure for heartache, the pain that hurts me in the eyes, and that which hurts in the heels and the forefeet, the waters, the most skilled of all physicians, shall put all that to rights. Ye rivers all, whose mistress is Sindhu River, whose queen is Sindhu, grant us the remedy for that. Through this remedy may we derive a benefit from you. Uh, that's Atarva Veda, chapter 6. We have a footnote that says the Rig Veda speaks of seven sacred rivers, the Sapta Sindhus of ancient India's past. The Sapta Sindhus were likely tributaries of the Sindhu or Indus River. Now we also read that the fires, the waters even extinguish the fire of jealousy. The wife of a jealous man is instructed to pour water over her husband. While doing so, she repeats, as if a fire is burning him, as if the forest fire burns in various directions, this jealousy of his do thou quench, as a fire is quenched with water. That's the Atharva Veda, chapter 7. That was pretty cool. Most importantly, the waters heal men's betrayals and falsehoods. Quote, whatever sin is found in me, whatever evil I have wrought, if I have lied or falsely sworn, O waters, remove it far from me. That's from Rig Veda Mandala 10. So this Rig Veda verse may be the origin of the ancient Vedic practice of spreading the ashes of the deceased in a river in hopes of exonerating all sins committed thereby ensuring a quick ascension to heaven. Interesting. So next, that was our first chapter. So next we are reading Purva and Uttara, Nakshatras. It's chapter, section, chapter two of this, section two of this chapter. So there are three sets of Purva and Uttara nakshatras. Each is in the stellar configuration of a bed or a cot, and each has similar themes, as well as closely associated ruling devatas. Further, the nakshatra labeled Purva, it's before or the former, such as this nakshatra, denotes an event or occurrence that naturally precedes the event identified with the labor, the nakshatra labeled Uttara, which means after Uttara, later. So the Purva comes before the Uttara, and it's an event, a cosmological event that precedes the Uttara. So by way of illustration, let's recall the wedding procession of the divine couple Surya, who's the daughter of the sun, to Soma, under Purva Falguni, the gods escort Surya to Soma's abode. You can see that in chapter, uh, the chapter about Purva Falguni and Uttara Falguni. So the ruling de devatas of Purva and Uttara Falguni are Aryaman and Pagha, respectively, although they might be switched. I think that, no, this is right. This is right. So they are Adityas, or sun gods, and they're also matrimonial devatas involved in matchmaking and bestowing wealth to newlywed couples. So the combined star configuration of the Falgunis is a nuptial bed, a marriage bed. Now, the third crew of Purva and Uttara Nakshatras, ruled by Aja Ekapada and Ahir Budnya, Budnya, Ahir Bud, Ahir Budnya. 
The Padrapadas is another set of Purva and Uttara nakshatras. Now, as these guys are Rudras, Aja Ekapada and Ahirbudnya are the fierce and life threatening aspect of thunderstorms. The distant sound of lightning, which is Aja Ekapada, the ruler of Purva Padrapada, forewarns of an, an impending thunderstorm. And that is Ahir Bhutnia, ruler of Uttara Padrapada. Now we also have a, a footnote here. The author speculates that Aja Ekapad and Ahir Bhutnia also represent the recently departed and newly imparted life force, respectively. This provides a second example of Purvan Uttara for the Padrapadas. Now, the Padrapadas' com combined stellar pattern in the sky, the constellation, is that of a funeral cot, for lightning and thunderstorms may be fatal. So then we have here the Ashadhas. Their stars lie within the bow and arrow of the old sidereal constellation of Sagittarius. So... I digress. What we what we know for sure is that the shared theme of the both of the Ashadas is victory and invincibility. That's Ashadha. They are renowned as battle nakshatras. Purva Ashadha is an expert in strategizing the attack that is won eventually under Uttara Ashadha. The tusk of an elephant is the symbol for both nakshatras. When severed, the elephant tusk regenerates. Thus, the tusk indicates the invincible nature of the elephant as well as the ashatas and any action that flows through them. The apas, the purva ashada, and vishvadevas, of the uttara ashada, are the ruling devatas of the Ashadhas. In another example of Purva, the waters, Apas, receive the universal germ of Agni and, becoming fertile, give birth to the gods, which is the Vishva Devas, all of the gods. And that gives us our quote it's, Waters indeed are all the deities since water is the origin of the universe and all of the deities. That's, that comes from the Taittiriya Brahmana. You can learn more about that in our chapter on Prajapati and Rohini. Now, our next section, we're going to be describing the goddesses as goddesses of purification and initiation. In the grand Brahmanic yagnas, water is the operative means for purification. Often sprinkling the yajamana with holy water, the priest declares him to be purified by all devatas, for the cosmic waters are the birthplace of the godheads. Quote, Consequently, it is by means of all the deities that they, the sacrificers, purify themselves when they purify themselves with water. So it's through the deities that this happens. The water is a connector point for that. Now, the notion of purification is suggested by Purva Ashadha's symbol, a winnowing fan or a basket used in the preparation of grains when we were looking at our um, you know I will often do my nakshatra sutras videos and in our nakshatra sutra video today we actually saw a tiny little picture of what is considered to be one of these winnowing fans I'll just show that here yeah you can kind of see it right Oops. it's in this top right corner here that's a winnowing fan. It's this thing that you put grains in and all the, the husks of the grain, you kind of crush all the grains so that the, 
the most the um the stuff that'll turn into thinnest powder is going to be the good part of the grain that can be made into flour and the rest of the shelly husk remains in the basket Whew, almost exited out of my video there <clears throat> so the notion of purification is suggested by the winnowing fan the basket that is used in the preparation of grains. This apparatus is used in the process known as wind winnowing, mm -hmm. in which the grain is tossed into the air repeatedly, causing the lighter husks and the dirt and pests to be blown away by the wind, while the heavier grain falls back into the basket. Wind winnowing. From this process comes the proverb separating the wheat from the chaff. In purification rites, the sins and misdeeds of the sacrificer are removed or separated or forgiven. The winnowing fan is also symbolic of food and nurturing. With sufficient water, grains grow abundantly. Thus, the apas goddesses give the wealth of food. We read from what I believe is the Shatapatha Brahmana. Nope. Oh yeah, Shatapatha Brahmana. Yeah. So this is the Shatapatha Brahmana. Oh divine waters, what rushing, high-peaked, wealth-winning wave ye have. Therewith may this one win wealth. Wealth is food. He thus says, May he thereby gain food. That's Shatapatha Brahmana. Now lastly, we read that water is the principal agent applied in ceremonial anointments, initiations, and rebirths. In an imperial manner, a king is initiated with holy waters during the Abhisachaniya, the unction ceremony. The Abhisachaniya. Uh, we read a bit more about this in the chapters on, in, in the chapter on Purva and Uttara Padrapada. So at this ritual, waters are drawn from sixteen different sources, including a river, the branch of a river, a whirlpool, a well, a tank, and others. Citing the Taittiriya Brahmana, Heisterman comments that Sarasvati is considered the source of all of these waters. The Sarasvati is the vertex, the Vishuvat, of the waters. The waters are related to Sarasvati in that he is consecrated with the waters related to Sarasvati he becomes the vertex. So that comes from Taittiriya Brahmana, chapter 1. Very interesting. So now this is the point where we read a little bit about Sarasvati and the seven rivers. The water goddesses take on various forms in the Rig Veda. Most notable is their portrayal as the seven rivers, the Sapta Sindhus. Sarasvati, which means flowing, Urjasvati, which is vigorous and powerful, Payasvati, which is fluid, Tarasvati, which is swift, Harasvati, which is seizing, Rodhasvati, which is high banked, and Bhasvati which is effulgent. Uh, there's a footnote here that comes from the Rig Veda Samhita, and there's a note on the Rig Veda. So we have to note, however, that Vedic scholars are not in agreement as to the rivers implicated by the Rig Vedic reference of the Sapta Sindhus. So there's not a full agreement on which rivers are implicated there. But we digress. 
The Sapta Sindhus are described as analogous to the cosmic waters, which become fertile by Agni's germ. Then they, ancient and young, who dwell together, the seven sounding rivers, received Agni's germ. That comes from Rig Veda Mandala 3. Varuna is the consort and king of these waters. And we read in Rig Veda Mandala 8, Thou, Varuna, to whom belong seven rivers, art a glorious god. The rivers flow into thy throat, as it were, a pipe with ample mouth. Now, of the seven rivers, Sarasvati is most renowned. She's often eulogized for her literal features. This stream, Sarasvati, with fostering current comes forth. Pure in her course, from mountains to the ocean, alone of streams, Sarasvati has listened. That's Rig Veda, Mandala 7. She's declared as well the mother of all rivers. From Rig Veda, Mandala 2. O best of mothers, O best of rivers, O best of godly powers, O Sarasvati, we are as if unworthy of repute. Please favor us with renown, O Great Mother. There are several hymns in the Rig Veda to Sarasvati's soul dedication, and countless verses that praise her name. Her prominence is equal to other Rig Vedic goddesses, such as Aditi, the mother of the gods, Prishni, mother of the Rudras, and Prithivi, who is the mother of earth. She kind of goes between all these. Depicted as the ancient meandering Sarasvati River, Sarasvati, more critically, is the mystic healing power of the word. She is honored during the Sautramanj, Sautramani ceremony, along with the Ashvins, celestial physicians of the gods, for having cured Indra with her sacred speech. Cool. This river goddess of the flowing, inspired word incites divine songs in devotees and stirs higher forms of thought in the spiritual aspirin. Her floods cleanse the intellect and illuminate truth. Now we hear a quote from Rig Veda Mandala 1. May Sarasvati, the, the fountainhead of all faculties, mental and spiritual, the purifier and bestower of knowledge, the recompense of worship, be the source of inspiration and accomplishment for all our organized benevolent acts. O Sarasvati, you inspire those who delight in truth. You instruct them who are diligent. Please assist us in our efforts to perform the organized sacred acts. Wow, beautiful. So she is one of the three Sarasvatis each connected with speech. There's Ida, which is praise, Sarasvati, which is eloquence, and Bharati, which is recitation. Forming an important triad in the Apri Suktas of the Rig Veda, the Sarasvatis join in sacrificial worship. Sarasvati, who perfects our devotion, Ida, divine, Bharati, all-surpassing, three goddesses with power inherent, seated, protect this holy grass, our flawless refuge. It's Rig Veda Mandala 2. There was a note that says each of the ten family composers of the Rig Veda has their own Aprishukta. In the later Brahmanas, these Shuktas serve as introductory verses to several important yagnas including the Pashupandas, the animal sacrifices. Now, 
The three Sarasvatis are associated with the category gods. Bharati with the Adityas has reached the sky. Sarasvati with the Rudras has favored this sacrifice. May we here feast with Ida, who is attended by the Vasus, the earth, the Tattva elements. And that's the Taitariya Brahmana. Now, Vak is the other important goddess of speech. She is mystically revered in the Rig Veda alongside Brahaspati, lord of the holy Brahman. When men, O Brahaspati, by name giving, brought forth the first sounds of Vak, that which was excellent in them, which was pure, secrets hidden deep, through love was brought to light. They followed the path of Vak through sacrifice, which they discovered hidden within the seers. They drew her out, distributing her in every place, Vak, with which the seven singers, the priests of the Angiras lineage, sing her tones and harmonies. Well, that's Rig Veda Mandala 10. The relationship between Vak and the Sarasvatis is perhaps explained by Vak's fourfold nature. It's i.e. para, it's eternal or infinite speech. Pashyanti, it's intuitive speech. Madhyama, which is mental speech or thought. And Vaikari, which is gross speech. Uh, we learn more about this in the chapter on Vishnu. Uh, to learn more about further descriptives of Vak's fourfold nature. As the main goddess of speech in the Rig Veda, Vak appears to be Padavak. The Sarasvatis align with the three remaining levels Aita with Vaikari, Sarasvati with Madhyama and Bharati with Pashyanti. Cool. Now, a footnote says, the author has correlated the Sarasvatis with the levels of speech based on their correspondence with the category gods. So thus, Aida, aligned with the earthy Vasus, is gross speech. Sarasvati, with the Rudras of intermediate space, is middle speech, and Parati with the heavenly Adityas represents intuitive speech. Beautiful. It's wonderful. So we read, by the time of the Yajurveda and Brahmanas, Vak loses much of her individuality to Sarasvati, for Sarasvati is Vak, according to SB, which I don't think is Shatta Brahmana. I guess that's shut the Brahmana. Yep, there's only one SB. So uh, Vak loses much of her individuality to Sarasvati, for Sarasvati is Vak. And that's why it's mentioned in here as falling out this way. Wonderful. I'm glad I got to share that. I'm glad I got to discuss a little bit of the nature of Abam, the goddesses, the sprinkled holy water of the Vedic sacrifices, the connection it has between Pum, Purva, Svaha, as the connector piece of all the worlds, uh, and being the goddess of Purva, Ashata, which is, as you might have heard, that's where my Rahu and Neptune and Uranus fall. So it's a very important placement for me. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. My name is Dustin Cormier. This has been How to Rock Astrology. Uh, stay tuned. I've always got more, more stuff to come out about the nakshatras and all things Vedic astrology. Thanks so much for watching.